Well, walking around here, it seems I see origami everywhere. But I am at MIT. What, what has origami to do with science or math? Yeah, well, origami has a surprisingly rich uh, mathematics and geometry to it. Um, it's I, I originally got interested in origami because uh, it just posed a lot of interesting mathematical questions. You have this sheet of material, and you have very simple rules. You can't stretch it and you can't tear it. And what can you do just by reconfiguration, just by folding? And so it's very kind of a simple setup, but the answers turn out to be surprisingly complicated and you need to use a lot of powerful geometry and algorithms to figure out what you can fold. In many senses, of, uh, you can really fold anything out of a sheet of paper and you can prove that mathematically. And that's sort of where we got started and it's, it's very exciting and finding more interesting ways to make structures that fold between different shapes. Also has a lot of practical applications in science and medicine and engineering. Um, where you want to build some kind of structure that can ch transform its shape from one thing to another. So maybe you want to uh, fold it down to some small size for storage or transportation. Like if you want to put something inside the body, maybe it needs to transport through small blood vessels, and so you need to make it very compact. Or you want to deploy something into space, you want to fold it small so it fits inside your space shuttle, and then you can unfold it when it gets there. Uh, I think it's even more exciting as you imagine uh, like buildings or gadgets or things that can transform from one shape to another and serve different functions depending on what you need. Maybe your house, uh, a room in your house can transform from a kitchen to a bedroom and this kind of thing. Um, one of the, a couple of the areas that we're exploring are uh, things like printing out robots. So there are a lot of rapid prototyping machines that are designed to make flat sheets of material. Um, and how can you use them to make 3D robots and other structures? Uh, and folding is a good way to do that. You can transform your two-dimensional sheets into some cool 3D structure. So we, one of our goals in this printable robot project is to make uh, robots that can, uh, for like 10 or $20 of materials, uh, you can cut them and make them within a couple of hours. And so everyone can make their own robot and customize their robot to do whatever they want. Um, another fun application is in uh, making nanoscale structures. So we have, out of the whole computer chip fabrication technology, we have really good ways to pattern two-dimensional surfaces at with nanoscale features like nanometer resolution. Uh, but we're not so good at making 3D structures at that scale. And so folding offers another way. That's more in process and experimental, but an exciting possibility for, for folding. And what's your position when you look, uh, because folding is something I understand, of course, but what makes your position uh, as professor so unique uh, in, the f in the folding process, if you understand what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah, so there are lots of different players interested in different aspects of folding, maybe more practical side. I'm more on the theoretical side and developing new mathematics and tools to show, uh, to help sort of kind of underlying technology to, for people to build on to make useful things. Um, so we especially like to prove what we call universality results, where we say in this kind of regime of origami design or folding design, you can make anything you want, and we give you a computer algorithm to do that. And so you can come in with your specifications like, oh, I'd like something that looks like this, and, it, and the algorithm will give you how to fold exactly that thing. Uh, and you know, we get very general results. They're not always the most practical, because often we don't take into consideration things like the thickness of the material or other kind of structural issues. It's something we're trying to get to. But uh, by kind of simplifying and looking at the core geometry, we can get very general and powerful results. And then that, those can be adapted to more practical scenarios. But when you fold, it seems like a limited possibility of, of things you can fold out of something. Or is that not true? You would think that there's a limitation, but I don't know. Every year, uh, I'm amazed at what origami artists uh, come up with. There's new people with new ideas, and it seems like almost limitless possibilities. And especially if you start with a large enough sheet of paper, you can really fold really, really complicated things. Uh, and there's still aspects we don't understand. For example, uh, a 
area we look at a lot is uh, curved crease folding. So most origami is made with straight creases. Curved creases are a lot harder to understand and analyze. And uh, we're starting to make progress on the mathematics, but there's still a lot we don't know. We don't have any good design algorithms to say, oh, I'd like to fold something that looks like this. Here's the curved creases you need to do that. So instead, we've been experimenting a lot with just playing around, trying different curved crease patterns and see what they produce and trying to be able to model that mathematically. And that led uh, my father and I into the sculptural side of paper folding. Uh, so most of the sculpture we made is, make is around curved crease folding. Initially, we were just experimenting, trying to figure out what's possible and, and what, what can be done. But we kept making all these beautiful forms and so started to embrace that as a purely sculptural endeavor as well. But there's a lot of back and forth, like that we'll do something sculpturally that'll inspire new mathematics, or we dis we understand something better about curve creases mathematically that inspires new sculpture. And so it's a lot of fun to go back and forth between the two. Between art and science. Right, between art and science. I think in general, that's a big appeal to why people uh, like to explore origami and mathematics together, uh, because you, you have this sort of scientific uh, purpose, maybe an engineering application or the beauty of the, the mathematics, but then one of the applications is also to make sculpture. Um, so it's really exciting to see these kinds of collaborations. A lot of engineering teams are bringing on origami artists uh, to help design new folding structures. So the artists have a lot of practical experience in how to make interesting folding structures and they they know the, the literature, which is a lot of people folding stuff, um, and then that can inspire and inform new scientific discoveries. And so you're, what you're doing, you're really on the edge of our knowledge in, in this part. Yeah, that's where we like to live is right on the edge of knowledge, where we, we have a lot of tools, but there's still something we don't understand, and so we try to push, push that frontier of what's, what's known uh, on the scientific side. And we use sculpture to kind of help explore that area more tentatively. We can, we can often make things that we don't yet fully understand, and so that lets us go a little beyond the frontier and sort of explore what's out there and see what's possible, and then hopefully and you, eventually understand that part mathematically. Yeah. And when you, when you look at uh, on the science part, on the frontier, what, what does it look like? When you look just over the frontier, well, what, what is the, the, the black hole where you look <laughs> Yeah, well, in general, we're looking at unsolved problems. Uh, I mean, part of, in some sense, one of the hardest parts is to figure out what the right question is. Uh, so you might want, there are sort of two types of questions about folding structures. One is I give you a structure and I want to understand its properties and uh, sort of an analyze what it does, how good it is, what it folds into. And uh, the other side is the design side. So you have some more high level specification of what you'd like to fold, and then you want to automate the design of a structure that folds with those parameters. Um, design's maybe the more exciting side. And but there's many different ways you might formulate what you want to fold. Uh, sort of the classic uh, origami design problem is, is shape design. I say, I give you a three dimensional shape, I want to fold that thing. Uh, what's a good way to fold that thing? And we're still we're still finding good algorithms for that. We have some general procedures that work, but they may not be so efficient. Uh, one of the standard measures of efficiency is if I have a square of a particular size of material, how large of a version of that shape can I fold? I don't want to fold a really tiny thing because that means I'm kind of wasting a lot of my material. If I have a big square, fold this little microscopic thing, it's not very efficient material usage. So how can we optimize that scale factor? We still don't know the best way to do that. Um, there's a sense in which you can't know exactly how good we can do that, but we can hope to approximate the best solution. Uh, so that's something we're still actively working on, for example. Our current favorite technique is called Orgamizer, um, and it's, a, it's also free software, and it's an algorithm we've been analyzing over the last several years to give it an arbitrary 3D shape, uh, it gives you a way to fold exactly that shape. Um, it seems to be a good method, but we don't know it's the best method. And then there are many other questions based on other types of goals you might want. Like maybe you want to have a folding structure that can make two different shapes. We don't know much at all about that question. 
or you want to make a folding that actually works with really thick material because you're making it out of sheet metal or you want to make a practical mechanical structure. Um, we're still understanding that we've made some progress on, but there's still a lot of questions. We don't know the best way to deal with with these kinds of uh, practical issues. And, and so that, and it's becoming really relevant these days because a lot of people are trying to build these structures. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I like to understand that threshold and, and ideally automatically design structures that always work really well in practice. So when you look at the applications, it's almost everywhere. I mean, you get you medicine, I can think of, what kind of examples can you give? It, it, it's really everything, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think we like to build objects and we and it's even cooler when those objects can change shape so almost anywhere you imagine a gadget of some sort i think folding could offer some interesting perspectives on on reconfigurability um let's see one uh one area we haven't talked about is um protein folding which is a kind of origami it's a little bit different um, but it's kind of essential to how just understanding how life works and also potentially drug design. Um, so every living thing that we know of in this world is built up out of lots of little proteins kind of making life happen. And proteins are essentially one dimensional pieces of paper that coil up into complicated 3D structures and that 3D structure kind of determines how it interacts with other proteins and what, what its function is. And we don't really understand that process of, of folding kind of a one dimensional strip of paper into uh, these these 3D structures, how nature does it, how we could do it, how we could design proteins that fold into geometries that we want to like combat. You could imagine some disease comes along, new disease, you could design a protein to fight specifically that disease. Uh, but we don't know how to design proteins that fold the way we want to. And so we're trying to understand how proteins fold in order to sort of just understand how biology is functioning, but also so that we can kind of control it in useful ways and kill viruses and things like that. So that's that's an exciting but difficult <laughs> direction. Um, I, I would really like a sort of universal programmable gadget. Um, you know, like we have lots of gadgets where you can download software updates, like your smartphone, you can download software updates and it does new things. Uh, but we don't yet have a gadget where we can download new shapes or new geometries, you can imagine. Uh, a kind of universal gadget that can take on any shape. I mean, it has to preserve mass, but uh, you could imagine it unfolding and becoming a large thing, uh, folding into a more compact structure, changing shape. Maybe it's a chair one, one moment and it becomes a bicycle the next moment, or I mean, anything in principle is possible. It's, we need to figure out what the practical regimes are, but uh, instead of having a separate gadget that does different functions or separate, separate furniture that does different things, you could imagine having fewer objects that are more reconfigurable. So that, that excites me. I, like, I really like gadgets. So <laughs> if I can have a gadget that can do more different things or be more customizable, I think that's really exciting. How did you get into folding? Uh, I, uh, a lot of people in the field got into folding because they've been folding since they were kids and doing origami and then they learn about mathematics and think, oh, uh, maybe we should combine these two. I came from the other side, so I was a, uh, a beginning graduate student at the University of Waterloo and uh, I was just curious, uh, I was looking for interesting problems to solve. I knew that I really liked geometry and algorithms and um, my father uh, remembered an old uh, unsolved problem that he had read about when he uh, years ago from a column by Martin Gardner, who used to write for Scientific American about mathematical games. And uh, it's a problem that comes from the magic community. Uh, and the concept is you take a piece of paper, you fold it flat and make one complete straight cut and then unfold the pieces. And magicians like Houdini could produce a five-pointed star or lots of different uh, simple shapes. And Martin Gardner was wondering, uh, you know, what are the limits? Can you make anything by this process or what can you do? And so that's the problem we started working on. It's like, okay, I've got geometry and algorithms now. Uh, this seems like a cool unsolved problem to work on. And it turned out to be fairly challenging. It took us a year or two to solve. Uh, but it also was very exciting uh, that we got our first universality result. We showed that you can make any 
polygon, any shape made out of straight sides, or actually you can make several shapes all at once just by one straight cut after folding. Um, so that was very exciting, um, fun problem motivated by magic. It turns out to have some practical applications also. Um, there are some designs for airbag folding, collapsing airbags flat, that are based on the same uh, kind of algorithm, though we didn't intend that at the time. Um, and it really got us excited about this world of folding, where it seems to have very rich and complicated mathematics, but also is kind of fun and visual, and you can you can demonstrate uh, these things. You know, you can fold a piece of paper and make a cut and make a swan or uh, whatever shape you want. So it has a, a tangibility that uh, everyone can kind of appreciate, even if they're not a mathematician. You can say, hey, look, we solved this magic problem. It's cool. <laughs> And you, uh, of course, we know something of your youth, but could you explain a little bit where did it all start? Because you, 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 you were saying a lot, me and my father, my father and me. Right. What, what, <laughs> what, what, what happened in the past? How did you grow up? Yeah, um, it's uh, where to start. <laughs> um, I guess my father became a single parent when I was two years old. Um, and so we've been close for a long time, um, especially from... Uh, when I was ages 7 to 11, we uh, started traveling together um, and visited many different places, mostly east coast of the United States, um, and just traveling for fun. There was no particular reason other than seeing different cultures within the United States and uh, exploring, which was really fun. And um, throughout that time, my dad treated me as a peer, uh, so we would jointly decide where we're going to go next, how long to stay in a place. Some places we'd stay just for a few days, other places we'd stay for years. Um, and that was a really fun and bonding experience for us growing up. And also because we were traveling a lot, we tried out homeschool. And homeschool turned out to work really well for us. Um, uh, we, I would spend only like an hour a day doing sort of the breadth of regular school. And so then I'd have many other hours during the day to explore things. And very quickly for me, exploring was uh, computer programming. I got really excited about that. Uh, essentially, out of video games, I played a lot of video games. I was curious how they were made. And my dad knew a little bit about computer programming to get us started. And then we'd go to the library to learn more. This was all before the internet. Um, and so I was sort of voraciously learning about computer programming and having a lot of fun there. And then when school got out, I would go and play with kids and things like that. Uh, so that was a really great time for me growing up. And I went very fast in the computer science and eventually mathematics side of things. Yeah, but, but I also understood you had, you had the, 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 you a fascination for puzzles. Just right, puzzles. yeah. Oh yeah, I skipped over that. Um, when I was uh, five or six years old, uh, my dad and I had our first collaboration, we like to say, um, with the Eric and Dad Puzzle Company. So um, I helped design um, wire take-apart puzzles, and my dad would make them, uh, bending wire, uh, and then we sold to toy stores across Canada, and we split the income 50-50, and it was a lot of fun. Um, that was definitely the beginning of my interest in puzzles, uh, which is still to this day it's something I, I like a lot, um, and probably also the beginning of my interest in mathematics and geometry and things like that, although that came much later. Well, you, you, you started at, university, uh, you, at, you, at college, I think, when you were 12. Probably. Yes. Yeah, so after we ended this travel, um, I wanted to learn more about Computing and computer science, I learned, was a, a thing, and you have to go to university to learn about it. So uh, there was some complication, but I uh, started uh, undergraduate at 12 and took lots of classes because at that age you can really soak in a lot of material. Um, and so I ended up finishing when I was 14 and then went to graduate school uh, and got a master's and PhD uh, by the time I was 20. Uh, and then uh, went on the job market and became a professor here at MIT. Yeah. And, uh, and this, this playfulness, what, you, what you're describing, that is, is, that is something that seems to be the core of you and your fathers. Yes. Yeah, it's really, um, we really value having fun and enjoying the work that we do. Uh, there's a very, uh, there's essentially no line between uh, the work that we do and the things we do for pleasure. So. It's all mixed together, uh, just with different kinds of outcomes. Maybe it becomes a math paper, maybe it becomes a sculpture, maybe it's uh, 
there's no outcome. We're just doing it uh, purely for fun, but it's all for fun. And the philosophy is that if we do work that we enjoy and find pleasurable, then we'll do it very well and we'll excel at it. And that has been a useful guiding principle. Um, and I would encourage everyone to do the same. It's definitely, it may seem risky at times. Uh, I mean, certainly there was a worry that the work that we do is too recreational. Like, you know, we're studying the mathematics of a magic trick. How could that be useful for anything? Though it turned out to be unexpectedly. Um, but I think a lot of, especially in mathematics, there are just a lot of basic questions that are very curious and you want to know the answer to. And if they're basic enough, sort of very simple setup, like paper folding is a very simple setup, very few rules about what's what you're allowed to do, and yet it's very complicated to understand. Uh, it's a nice context for, I think, basic research tends to become useful eventually, uh, even though you may not see the applications ahead of time. And so mathematicians tend to be attracted to like very simple questions that have complicated answers those tend to be also useful questions to answer. Not always, but if you solve enough of them, many of them will become practical. And so even though you do it for fun, it tends to have useful applications as well. So the, you, might, you might be worried by a lack of applications, but it turns out to be okay. Yeah. That's quite beautiful that you are able to somehow combine all these elements in your life. It's really sweet. I mean, we have a pretty much ideal setups where we can work on what we enjoy and get paid for it and have fun doing it and have all the resources to do it. Uh, yeah, we're very lucky. Yeah. And in what way does the glass, uh, the, the, the working with glass, uh, fit in this? Yeah, so the glass blowing interest comes from uh, my dad's background, which is more on the visual arts side. So before I was born in the late 60s, early 70s, he had the first glass studio in Canada. So he's called the Father of Canadian Glass. Um, and so he uh, had a had a studio, made lots of glass work. It was it was the early days in the studio movement of glass blowing in in North America. And so he was experimenting, exploring what's possible, trying different recipes to make glasses and glass colors and things. Um, and then he didn't blow glass for many years uh, until, and I never really saw him blow glass until we came to MIT uh, 15 years ago and we discovered, hey, MIT has a glass blowing studio called the Glass Lab. Um, and so uh, my dad got curious to try glass blowing again. And so he started teaching there, uh, became one of the instructors and uh, started blowing glass again. And then I got to see him blow glass and watched him uh, make things. And it's so beautiful and amazing to watch. And then eventually it's like, hmm, maybe, maybe I should try glass blowing. My dad said, yeah, you know, you should at least see what it's like but be careful, it's addictive. And so uh, I quickly got into glass blowing and now we blow glass together and make things together and it's, it's a lot of fun. And what's the, it's scientifically seen? What, what, does, it, does it also translate itself in, into your scientific work? It's a little more difficult because there's a lot of physics going on with glass blowing, which is not exactly my forte, but we're always looking for interesting math connections between mathematics and glass blowing. Um, and we've found we found some interesting hooks there. I think there's still a lot more to be explored. I would love to have algorithms to automatically design interesting, because this, the sort of operations you can do are glass, in glass blowing are very simple. Uh, you know, you can, uh, you're turning your piece, you can swing it around, you can play with sort of gravity in this way, you can heat different parts and cool other parts, and that totally changes the shape that you produce. But it's a very complicated relationship, and so it's hard to model all of that mathematically. Uh, but we've found some interesting regimes where it's simple enough that it's mostly geometric what's going on. And so we can use computers to help design new patterns in glass. So we have uh, some free software called Virtual Glass that we've been developing where you can design what are called glass cane patterns, a very simple, uh, conceptually simple, but hard to visualize, uh, where you set up some essentially straight lines of color in glass and then twist them. And so you get some really cool twisty patterns. They've been used in glass blowing for, for centuries. Uh, but pretty much everyone who makes glass cane follows one of standard set of patterns. 
And so we were curious whether there were more patterns for glass cane that were possible. And this software lets you explore those patterns and lets you try new things. And sometimes you try a new thing and it looks kind of like an old thing. So it's not really interesting, but other times you try a new pattern and it looks amazing in the software. And that tells you here, this is something we should spend the time to actually learn how to make in real life. The software doesn't tell you exactly how to make it, but it gives you a kind of schematic and then you have to do the, the glass blowing hard work, but at least you know that the thing you're trying to make is really beautiful. And so it's worth working towards. So you can to rapidly try lots of different designs in the software to find the one you want and then go physically make it. Yeah. So this relation between art and science is, is quite important. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think in general, working on the boundary between two different fields, you find interesting areas that um, people tend to specialize in, in just one area. And so they miss the things at the boundaries. And so we've had a lot of fun exploring these boundaries. And I think it comes partly from our different backgrounds. My dad with the art background, me with the more math and science background. And we're always talking to each other. And so we see, we see the connections. Uh, when I started graduate school, I was doing this sort of more theoretical mathematical work. My, my dad saw it and said, wow, that looks, it's interesting. This kind of creativity you're going through in solving unsolved mathematical problems is very much like the kind of thing that I go through in designing new sculptures or thinking about new art to build. And so we started working together then and he got, he, I taught him to become a mathematician and he taught me to become an artist. And so now we work on both together and it's really, it's a lot of fun for us to collaborate in that way, but also it leads to really interesting questions and inspirations where uh, instead of just thinking, okay, the math is the serious stuff and everything else is just uh, you know, side project. We think of everything as like main projects and they inspire each other in ways that we couldn't predict. Yeah. And when you, when you, when you our, our series um, intends to, to really portray the, the scientists that are working on the frontiers of science. Do you see yourself as, as, as a person that is working on the frontier of knowledge, the frontier of science? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, you could say frontiers of science and art, maybe, but, uh, or that interplay. But uh, yeah, we're always, as scientists, we're always excited about the unknown. And I mean, that's as soon as we understand something fully, it becomes almost boring and we want to move on to the next thing. I mean, we write down what we know and publish it uh, and share it with the world so they can build on top of it. But then we're always uh, excited about the next question, which we don't understand. That's, that's really what drives us is the, the parts that we don't quite understand or like that seems a little strange and we're curious about. And uh, yeah, that's, that's where, where we explore next. And when you th think about uh, you, uh, the, 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 the problems that, that you are solving now, um, when you look two years ahead, for example, what, 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 <laughs> what are the, the, the things that you might have answered, what the problems you might have answered? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think in the, in the folding regime, I, I work in many different areas, but uh, in the folding world, uh, I think the biggest challenges right now are taking the nice mathematical and geometric design algorithms that we have and adapting them to, to real world materials. So we're starting to look at how does uh, the thickness of the material affect uh, what we can fold? How does the rigidity of material affect what we can fold? Often you're making things out of plates and hinges, so you can really only fold at the creases, whereas in paper it's more flexible uh, between the creases. So this is a world called rigid origami, still trying to understand how to design within that space, but it's very practical and exciting. And for us, it's nice and challenging because we don't know, that's, that's what we don't know how to do. And so that's where we're attracted. So I think in the next couple of years, we'll make a lot of progress in that kind of trying to take the rich and very general mathematics and adapting it to more how to deal with the parameters of real world materials. When you look next to the to the, uh, the folding, other areas, are other fields where you're where you're working on, can you explain, elaborate a little bit on that also? Yeah. Um, let's see. There are a lot of so I mean, like the traditional origami setup is you have a square of paper and all you can do is fold, and 
it's really interesting to see what you can do just by folding. But uh, there are a lot of practical setups, like in our printable robots project, where uh, it's also fine to cut the material. I mean, why not? It's, uh, folding is very powerful. It's a good way to go from 2D to 3D, but we don't have to start from a square of material. Probably we're starting from some kind of rectangle of sheet, sheet material, and why not also cut it in two dimensions before you fold? And that's exciting because it can lead to much more efficient foldings. Potentially you use all of the material now and you can make structures you couldn't make just by folding or you can not You can make them much more efficiently in different ways. It's also a little, it's tricky from a mathematical perspective because now we have so much more freedom. We can cut and fold. Uh, in some sense, it's more freedom than we know what to do with. And so that's that's kind of a new direction of folding where we also allow cutting because why not? It's a practical thing you can do. Um, and maybe there are some settings where you want to add lots of cuts, some settings where you want to add fewer cuts. We don't know the right balance between those. And I think that's a, a new frontier we're still exploring and trying to, to understand, but potentially leads to much better ways of folding structures. And uh, going back um, to your to, to your youth, the fact that you were able to live this freely and this um, uh, travel around the United States and, and, and maybe other countries also, um, uh, and being playful, which lots of kids uh, don't have that space to be hmm. that playful. In, right. in what way do you think that, that gave you this freedom, the opportunity to become what you, what you are now? I, th I think it played a big role. I mean, it's hard to know exactly, but um, I think growing up with so much free time, unstructured time, where I could just explore what interested me really gave me a, a big edge. Uh, instead of sort of wasting time, which a lot of schools do, just uh, filling the time so uh, as a kind of childcare <laughs> setup, um, there's social aspects which are good too. Uh, but a lot of time I feel like is wasted in school. And so having the homeschool opened up this window where I could explore what interested me and, and really dive in deeply. And that let me go far ahead in the computer science world. And I think in general could let students go really far ahead in the thing that excites them the most. You still have to add in the breadth and, and uh, socialize with other kids and so on. Uh, but it really, uh, and then going to university at a young age, I think really uh, gave me another edge where is you can learn so much at a young age. And so when you get to university, suddenly there's really interesting things you're learning and it's really exciting. And I still remember the things that I learned back then. Um, so that's really powerful um, as a way to, to get started. And I think a lot of people could do it. Um, there's also a more general sense of because we were improvising as we went along, uh, traveling around, we would talk to our neighbors, learn about what they knew about, and if they knew some interesting topic, they would teach me and teach my dad. Um, so I learned different aspects of mathematics that way. I learned different kinds of cooking that way. Um, and that was a fun way to, uh, let's say, to appreciate different people and different backgrounds and different knowledge sets, and I think indirectly that influenced me and my dad to uh, think a lot about collaboration. In, in current day, we, uh, we collaborate with a lot of different mathematicians and different papers. I've written papers, I think over 400 people at this point. Um, and on the art side, we're also always looking for collaborators, interesting ways to combine different ideas from different minds. We collaborate a lot with each other, of course but also looking for outside inspiration. I think when you combine multiple people together, you can really, you can solve problems that could not be solved individually. On the mathematical side, this is because there's just so many areas of mathematics, uh, you can't really know all of them, uh, but some problems require lots of different tools to solve. And so you could either go and learn about that tool, and it takes a long time, or you could just collaborate with the person who already knows the tool and they can solve that piece of the problem really well, you can solve your piece, you combine the right people, you can solve big problems relatively easily. Uh, and on the art side, you get inspiration, things that no one person could make because they have the creative voice from multiple people. You have to be willing to let go of your own ego to do this. And I think that 
probably for my dad and I came from this period where we're just kind of exploring together and being open to the people that we meet and learning from them. Mm -hmm. Is that an equation for fun? <laughs> uh, not that I know of. Uh, it's an interesting challenge to try to model fun or humor or surprise mathematically. And I've heard, I know, I have some friends who are trying to answer that question, but I don't know of one. It's sort of, uh, I usually go by, it's the, you know it when you see it kind of definition. <laughs> can you, can you uh, imagine something with our titles, series titles, the mind of the universe? If we create with each other the mind. I see. Yeah. Sphere. Yeah. Um, it's certainly a fascinating topic to think sort of at a high level. Like mathematics, for example, has a kind of uh, a branch uh, mathematical logic where it tries to understand, where we try to understand mathematically what mathematics is and why it works or when it works, when it doesn't work. Uh, but of course, the mathematics we practice in real life is a kind of a social dynamic you know do you believe what someone claims and they have a proof written down there but to really check the proof you have to check it very carefully um, and it's humans aren't perfect and so it's there's a social dynamic to the the, the body of research we we create and uh, in some ways it makes it more fascinating and colorful that that kind of mind share of what we know or what we think we know is always kind of changing. Usually we're adding things we think are true or we claim are true. Sometimes we take them back away. We <laughs> look at an old theorem and people have been building on and realize, oh, actually that proof is wrong. And then there's a, a flurry of activity trying to fix the proof or make a new proof so that the results that are built on it are, the result may still be true, but sometimes we need to find a new way to prove it. Sometimes the results end up being false and that's that's more it's occasionally scary, but it's exciting. <laughs> uh, always trying to discover new things, but also make sure they're really correct. And definitely, to me, one of the appeals of mathematics is that you, there is at least a sense of real truth, of ultimate truth, uh, that in principle, if you're doing it correctly uh, and you prove something, you really know that it is without a doubt true. And there's no other area where you can be as certain uh, but still, even then, we're still not quite certain because humans make mistakes all the time. But you have origami to prove it. Yeah, so, I mean, art. certainly uh, we can see, lots, we can kind of build up lots of evidence that something is true by constructing lots of examples and sculpture and, and more practical engineering structures and so on. But to know that it's always true is a little bit different to know that it's usually true. <laughs> You just said earlier that uh, you, you started with with puzzles, also the puzzle company with your with your father. Right. What uh, what does the puzzle what do the puzzles mean in the games for you now? Yeah, puzzles have remained an active interest, and um, in some sense, all the mathematics we do is a kind of puzzle. We have some setup of like what you're allowed to do, say with paper folding or or some other simple mathematical structure, and the puzzle is. You know what's possible. What can you make? These are kind of meta puzzles in a sense, uh, but even puzzles themselves, like uh, the kind of uh, board game puzzles you get, or like sliding blocks, or these kinds of things, are actually really interesting to study mathematically as well. And uh, so my dad and I and many collaborators like to explore the mathematics of games and puzzles. And we do it for video games, like we've studied Tetris and Super Mario Brothers and other Nintendo games that I grew up playing, now I can study them mathematically. And the sorts of things that we prove are that it's really hard to play these games perfectly. So if you, if I give you a level of Super Mario Brothers and say, can you get from start to finish, that's actually a computationally difficult problem. And you can prove that uh, solving that problem is really hard for a computer to do. And my philosophy is that humans are essentially a kind of computer. And so that tells you that it's also really hard for humans to play these games perfectly or to solve these puzzles, to play a Tetris game optimally or to slide blocks around to get one block out of the box. Uh, all these problems are really, really hard. And I think it helps explain 
for humans why we enjoy them, because humans like a challenge. Things should be challenging, but not too difficult. And proving these problems are computationally difficult. They're still solvable, given enough time. But in general, you need uh, an amount of time that grows exponentially with the size of the puzzle. And so uh, that means it's beyond a certain size, it really becomes intractable. And in a small size, it's a challenge, but still feasible. I think that's why it's fun to have this kind of mathematical justification for why we like playing games and puzzles. And it's also a fun way to explore puzzles and games that I grew up with or know or love and be able to study. Studying them from a mathematical perspective lets me essentially play the game, but in a more interesting way in some ways. Usually we have to design new levels, new puzzles within a, a, a design space in order to show that, oh, we can build uh, like logic gates and we can essentially build a computer within this game or puzzle. And that's how you show that it's hard for a computer to play because computers are not, it's really hard for a computer to simulate a computer essentially. Uh, it's sort of the hardest thing that they can do. And uh, so we get to have fun by playing the game, by designing new levels and, and so on in order to prove these kind of interesting mathematical results that actually this game is really challenging and, and difficult. And when, you, when you look at, at new games, how do you look to them as a, as a child or as a scientist? Uh, a bit of both, <laughs> certainly. I also just like playing games, playing board games, playing video games, I and mean, that's a lot of fun just as a as mediums to explore human experience, I guess. Um, and I, I like the, the role-playing aspects. I like the um, having fun with friends aspect or exploring a world. It's, I mean, these days video games tell really powerful stories, and so it becomes a new medium for storytelling. Uh, so lots of more personal and just sort of fun aspects of, like that as, as I would be as a, as a kid playing again. And there's definitely a lot of nostalgia Playing, even playing old games uh, as uh, new again, they still hold up as being very exciting. Um, but there's always, even when I'm playing just for fun, uh, there's always in the back of my mind thinking, hmm, I wonder if we can set this up as a clean mathematical problem and analyze the complexity of this game. Uh, and some games are more amenable to this kind of mathematical analysis. Some of them require some adaptation to be a lot of games have a lot of different elements. It's really complicated. And mathematics is really good at getting at the core of a problem. So it's a lot better when you have set up a simplified version. Maybe you say, oh, let's just focus in on this one particular aspect of the game, uh, which if that's hard, then the whole thing is, of course, also even harder. And so you can kind of isolate out the different parts and tease out an interesting mathematical problem out of a real game or puzzle and then analyze that. So, uh, I mean... It's, it all fits together. So as I'm playing a game, I'm always thinking about, hmm, I wonder what I could tease out of this game. And as I'm playing and having fun, I'm also trying to think about that, that mathematical formulation. So it's good because then you get inspiration for new problems to solve just by having fun all day. <laughs> and when, when you were young, what kind of puzzles did you, did you sell with your, with your father? Like what kind of puzzles were those? Yeah, I, I should get one. Um, but uh, we made these wire take-apart puzzles. So each, so it's multiple pieces. Each piece is just made out of a, a piece of metal wire that my dad would bend with pliers into shape. And so uh, one shape might be uh, a treble clef or some, some recognizable shape or a house. I remember designing that one. Um, and then there'd be other pieces attached to it. Everything's made out of wire, uh, maybe some metal rings also. And so these pieces appear to be interlocked, and the challenge is to separate them. And so while they look interlocked, there's actually some complicated procedure for uh, pulling one piece out of the other. And then you've solved the puzzle, and then you have to put it back in and give it to someone else to solve. So these are challenging, the kind of a mix of geometry and topology um, in their design. And uh, yeah, they're a lot of fun. It can be quite hard. <laughs> Some of them require hundreds of moves to solve. Some of them are easy if you know how. <laughs> you were telling. Yeah, so um, there, I think that the challenge of a human playing video games comes from different elements. Um, and some parts are easy for a computer 
to solve, and other parts we show are difficult for a computer to solve. So if you imagine like uh, solving a, a level of, of Super Mario Brothers, there's there's kind of the physics and like the physical aspect of pushing the buttons at the right time, either pressing them really quickly or at exactly the right moment, just before you fall off a ledge, you jump and land in the right place. That sort of thing a computer is actually really good at doing. And there are people who exploit that in the tool-assisted uh, plays, plays of games where they use computers to like slow everything down and time exactly the right moment to make a jump and things like that. Um, so computers can do some aspects really well, but there's kind of a, there's a broader meta level in solving a puzzle or solving um, a level in a video game where you need to plan out, I should do this thing first, and then I'll go do this thing, and there's a time limit, and so it's really sensitive to how I should plan out the overall execution of the level. Executing it might be hard for a human, easy for a computer, but the planning part uh, you, for a sufficiently complicated game is usually really difficult, and you can prove that that's computationally challenging. Now, real-world levels and puzzles are usually designed to be right at the edge where you have to try several different options, but it's not impossible. Um, but in some sense, the, that challenge comes out of this, this broader setting that if you have a really large level, you can encode a really hard problem inside that, that puzzle, and solving it, uh, you can show it's hard even for a computer to play. So uh, another example is like Tetris. You have Tetris, the usual, the practical challenge is that you have this time limit. You know, the piece is falling. You have to decide where to put it really fast. Um, and computers are good at doing things really fast. But deciding where to put it is actually really hard. Um, and you can, you can show that. Uh, the sort of long-term planning of where you should put your pieces so that you won't run out of space in your Tetris board, that's actually computationally intractable also. So it's an interesting, I think real world games, you have this interesting mixture of making it hard for a human by giving time limits or physical execution can be challenging. And then you have this mastery aspect, which is very appealing to gamers. Uh, but then usually there's this underlying computational difficulty that, so you're solving this hard problem under time constraints that is exciting for people. I think. This, is, this research and investigating of gaming, is it also, um uh, math for, for in your scientific field uh, important, and, 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 and did you find new 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 uh, research, uh, mm, I see. consequences of gaming? There definitely are some consequences. A, a lot of uh, games are, in some sense, a like video games are uh, often an abstraction of a real world problem. Uh, a typical example is motion planning. So you're either you have a bunch of robots or you're a bunch of people trying to execute some goal. You have a lot of objects. You want to rearrange them into a particular pattern. Maybe you're in a warehouse moving products around. That every, every product has a place it needs to go. What's the optimal way for moving all these parts around? That's, those kinds of problems end up in a lot of video games also, usually in a somewhat abstracted and simplified form. Uh, so proving that those problems are hard shows also that these kinds of uh, more real world problems are, are difficult as well. Maybe you can, or it helps you maybe try to isolate what are the, what is special about the real world instances. Maybe your warehouse is mostly two dimensional because you don't stack lots of things. Or what, what are the specialities of the real world instance that make them easier than the video game? So there's definitely that kind of interplay. Uh, but. I think a lot of people study, the, and myself included, study the complexities of, of these games and puzzles because it's fun and it's kind of a, a recreational pursuit. So it's a little bit less serious than some areas of mathematics and computer science, but still we enjoy it and it's kind of a fun, I use it a lot as a way to get uh, students excited about research because most people come in with their own background of like what are fun games and puzzles that they grew up playing and those inspire new uh, mathematical problems, either directly about those games or about sort of the underlying principles. And uh, these kinds of hardness proofs, we call them, to show that these games are computationally intractable are a nice way to get started in research because you get to play with the game. You get to use the expertise you have from having grown up playing this game. You've probably spent way too many hours playing them. And that expertise is actually really helpful for solving the underlying math problem. And it can get people excited about Oh, this is this is computer science research. I want to do more of this. Um, there's also the I think the broad appeal of you know there's there's some mathematical results that are hard for 
uh, the general public to appreciate. But you analyze a game or a puzzle that everyone has played or a big segment of the population has played, and they can appreciate like, oh, yeah, I remember that being really hard. And, oh, you can prove that mathematically? Oh, that's interesting. I wonder how they do that. And that can inspire people to enter the field or at least get a, uh, a curiosity or, and, and learn about uh, fields that they're not necessarily working in and appreciate that, oh, there's interesting things you can do about problems I happen to care about because most people like games. And so this is an, a nice kind of broad appeal connection. Yeah. Uh, then now one question that you, you know the answer is very difficult, but where are you standing in 10 years? In <laughs> 10 years, wow. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to know exactly where my research will take me. I definitely like MIT as a base uh, because it's, I mean, there are amazing students here, amazing people doing all sorts of great and crazy things and just a lot of flexibility to essentially do what we want, uh, explore whatever we find interesting. And so what will be most interesting to us in 10 years is hard to guess, but uh, this definitely is a nice, powerful base to do it from. So definitely enjoying my time here.